Welcome to hell. That is the MIDI converter. Uh, welcome to season six, episode one of Vine on the Throne of a game of vines of Vinny's Vine discussion of sauce and Game of Thrones. And that needs to be turned off. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Hi, everyone. Hello. Oh, uh, man, that's uh, that's a horrible sound, isn't it? I don't have a name for this, but I this is the first time I've done this, and I, I wanted to, um, since I wasn't around to stream or talk about Game of Thrones on Sunday, I wanted to do it here. So this is basically just um, me talking about Season 6, Episode 1 of Game of Thrones. I'm not going to be doing any Red Vox or music stuff here. I just did this so that people wouldn't come to the main channel in droves, and then I would disappoint them with uh, just a talk show of sorts. Um, I want to actually talk to you guys, too, about the episode and get your thoughts and feedback on certain moments. And, um, yeah, I mean, so anyway, if, if this isn't your thing, if you're not into Game of Thrones, then I have no problem. You come back later. I'll be streaming tonight on the main channel, so I'll see you then. Um, this will be archived. So, yeah, sorry, everyone. Everyone who is expecting music. There will be music here at some point. I could give you a preview of Scoot the Burbs later if you're interested, <laughs> which I started recording. Um, I just can't do vocals for it right now because as soon as I start start singing Scoot the Burbs, I hear people walking around. I think they think I'm a little bit mentally challenged uh, when I sing Scoot the Burbs. Yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, eat a dick. It's the lyrics. But yeah, I'll see you guys later. If you're not into Game of Thrones, if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, just pass for now. And I will see you on the main channel a little bit later. I don't know when, maybe a few hours. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. My experience with Game of Thrones is um, I've read A Song of Ice and Fire up until, of course, where we're at in the books because Winds of Winter is not out yet. I'm a big fan of the books. I like the show a lot. And I'm a really... Um, big fan of, of of lot of what's going on in the show and then a lot of it makes me aggravated which um leads us to season six now up until season five i felt like the show was pretty goddamn flawless at times it was some of the best tv that i've i've ever seen because i love medieval type shit anyway so for me it was just my perfect kind of show um, it did some good justice to the books and it really kind of made the books great to see. Like you, you kind of had a visual of what was happening in the books, even if certain things were left out. Then the changes started happening and we've been, you know, seeing changes or cut characters for quite a while. But season five is when it got really noticeable. Um, a lot of things in season five angered me. And a lot of things in season six so far are carryovers from season five. And I'm going to do like kind of a play by play of the episode and uh, we'll talk about it and we'll compare it to the books a little bit. And uh, also, this is the first time as show watchers, people won't be able to spoil things for you because the books have been uh, cut. Uh, or the, the cutoff, rather, has happened, and we're now almost beyond a lot of the things that are happening in the books. Um, in some places, well beyond, or, you know, we're on our way to be. And that's kind of scary, because the source material, I think, is what made Game of Thrones such a good show. And David and Dan are starting to prove that, yeah, they can do a good job with some of it, but then other plot lines are just getting, like, grossly distorted, um, I'll try not to be too much of a book snob and I'll try to just judge the show as a show. But unfortunately, when you have source material that is very good, it's hard to ignore some of the shortcomings. Um, once again, for anyone joining, this is a stream all exclusively about Game of Thrones. going to be maybe 45 minute discussion about the episode. This will be up on full sauce, I, th I think, because I figure I like kind of I listened to a lot of podcasts on the way to Boston and I was like you know I, I like Game of Thrones why don't I do a little talk show thing about it 
and uh, just upset people with my views, which is very commonplace. Also, uh, fuck The Walking Dead. We just revel in the hatred. The Walking Dead's another show that has its moments that I, I enjoyed a lot and then dipped really far down and then dipped back, kind of went back up and then just I lost interest, which is a shame. Game of Thrones doesn't feel that way. Game of Thrones is kind of more, and I read the comics in, for Walking Dead. Game of Thrones has still maintained a level of quality that I think is really hard to find on, on a TV show, even in this as they say, golden age of TV, Game of Thrones has been pretty goddamn consistent. And season six so far is pretty good. And I'm looking forward to more of it. But, um, well, let's begin. Spoilers ahead. Spoilers ahead, everyone. And here's where we start. You get a view of Castle Black. And there's the wall. And there's Jon Snow uh, lying dead in a pool of his own blood. I told you the spoilers were, were going to start right away. This is the first kind of sequence. And from there you get, you know, Davos kind of talking about, um, he, he finds out that Jon's dead and he, he takes Jon's body in and, and he tries to, you know, guard the body. And uh, he realizes that something, something mutinous has happened. Something terrible has happened. Um, again, this is already, we're further than Dance with Dragons. There's been no indication of what happens to Jon Snow in the books. Cause the very last, you know, bit that we got from the books was Jon Snow getting stabbed. If you don't remember, Jon Snow got stabbed by his people and those people suck. Also, fuck Ollie. Alistair Thorne, I believe is doing pretty much what he thinks is right. I think Alistair Thorne is is probably one of my more uh, one of my more liked villains because he's not a villain. He's not a mustache twirler. He is a man of the Night's Watch. He's a dude that wants to do what he thinks is right, and he he decides to lead a mutiny against their Lord Commander Jon Snow. And he's a dick about it, but it's for the watch. And then the rest of the guys, Bowen Marsh. And Ali and whoever else was there just decide to uh, continue stabby. And so we get to the point where, yeah, now we're beyond the books and it sucks. And Davos thinks this sucks. And Davos is like onions. And he's really happy that he doesn't have to uh, hang out with Stannis anymore. Because Stannis went from Stannis the Manus to Stannis the Anus the last season. Um, but yeah, the whole Night's Watch stuff, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this, this season, because again, I'm sure the, the writers, David and Dan got information from George R.R. R. Martin on where the story was going to go. I'm almost positive. George was like, well, here's a loose outline. Here's a loose out. Sorry. Here's a loose outline of what, uh, what we're going to do in the books. And they probably stuck with it as accurately as they could to a certain extent, which is a theme of the show lately where we get some degree of, of accuracy. And then, then we just go off the rails and uh, hint a lot of the times that we go off the rails. It isn't quite as good in my, in my personal opinion. Uh, so far, I'm really enjoying the, the night's watch plot. I like um, Sir Davos a lot. He's one of my favorites. That's the back. There he is. And uh, I, I love, I love uh, Liam Cunningham, I believe is the actor's name. He's amazing. And he is true to the end, a great fucking guy, which they're in short order in Westeros. So I love Davos and he knows what he's got to do. He takes the body inside. He wants to protect it. And he wants to gather as many faithful brothers that aren't scumbags as possible. Um, that's pretty much, you know, it. And then, then Melisandre the red woman, which is the name of the episode, um, goes to the, the area and, uh, you know, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but let's just say that I am intrigued and I'm interested. Um, before we go any further, I, I should say that a lot of people are surmising that Jon Snow will come back. And I feel like that's a very accurate prediction because why, why not? 
why would he why would they do that um sure they got ned they got rob but i think john for a number of reasons that book readers might agree on and even show watchers it it feels like john snow just can't be dead uh the producers of the show and the actors are all like oh no he's gone he's dead but i think um melisandre's arrival at castle black is a little too coincidental and i think i don't know how long they're going to drag this out maybe another two episodes maybe one more episode but i think um similar to thoros of mir we're going to see melisandre do a little something and we're going to get i think john snow kind of back a little you know a little worse for the wear a little worse for the tear but i think he'll be he'll be back you know kit harrington is he's been pretty uh, good at hiding his involvement but i i think um it's pretty it's pretty clear that we're going to get more john snow that said this episode he is not in fact revived theories have included that he'll be reborn as ghost and you know he'll just warg into ghost which is kind of a funny theory and i don't uh, imagine that a main character of the show that's just a dog i'm sorry direwolf doesn't sound too uh, appealing you know, I mean, how is the direwolf going to get Kit Harrington's mannerisms down? You know, the dog has to learn how to say, brother, Egret, Castle Black, the wolf, brother. That's hard. You can't teach a wolf how to speak. Anyway, yeah, so I'm I'm really um, enjoying the plot here. Then you have more of that. Melisandre arrives and... Alistair Thorne. I like Alistair Thorne here. He's basically just, you know, oh, yeah, you know, I did it. Someone in the audience, you know, someone, one of the members of the Night's Watch is like, who did it? He's dead. Sir Alistair's like, I did it. And it's like, wow, that dude just completely owns up to it. And they pretty much just accept it. They're like, okay, Sir Alistair, you, you did it. Uh, why? And he's like, well, because he, we don't like wildlings because I don't like change. I don't like change. I don't like things that are new and they're bad people, which leads me to believe or leads me to wonder why did no one who was at hard home last season explain about the zombies and the skeletons that came back to life and the fucking Night's King and, and all the, the slaughter that happened. Did anyone mention this to Sir Alistair and the rest of the brothers? I mean, and maybe just the people that are in the room with Jon Snow. But you'd think, I mean, with pressing matters, like really pressing matters of, I don't know, possibly the destruction of Westeros to a bunch of ice zombies that are nearly indestructible. You, you'd think that maybe they would band together and someone would be like, you know what? You're right. We do need these wildlings. Maybe we, we shouldn't. Um, let Sir Alistair get away with this. But most of the, the Night's Watch are just like, oh, you did it? And with your poopy head? And then Sir Alistair's like, I never disobeyed a command. So what if Jon Snow said to him early on, I order you not to kill me? And then Sir Alistair would have disobeyed a command if he killed him, and then, then they could have. Um, anyway, that's a cool moment there. Um... Maybe a plot hole. And we see Winterfell uh, about 10 minutes in. And you have... Uh, that's going to annoy me. There you go. That's a little bit better. Um, you have the Winterfell plot line. And oh, look, Miranda. Theon. Uh, not Theon. Uh, Ramsey is, is just, you know, for a moment he shows humanity. And then he's like, oh, by the way, feed her to the dogs. I guess we're not going to have too much sympathy for Ramsay after all. The thing about Ramsay is he's such a sociopath, such a piece of shit, but he is full of this weird, crazy charisma that makes that makes you enjoy watching him, even if you hate him. Um, I, I lend that mostly to the actor. He did a, he's doing an amazing job with Ramsay. I love his portrayal. What's his name? It's like, uh, I win Rayon. I don't know how to say his name, guys. I know how it's spelled, but I don't know how to say it. But he's amazing, and he's upset that Miranda's dead for all of a minute and a half, and then, eh, that's good meat. 
And then, um, you know, a, a Roos, the Roos is loose, McBolton. This dude here, he's like, well, you know, you have to, you, you have to find her, Sansa, because because Snasna has escaped uh, with Theon, if you remember the end of last season. And he's like, look, you got to find her because otherwise you're kind of like, you're kind of like pointless. And uh, you don't want to be pointless because I'm Roos Bolton and, you know, I, I brought you into this world. I could take you out of it. Anyway, good scene between father and son. Loving, very loving. And uh, at the end, there's kind of this good acknowledgement of like, well, if Roos doesn't necessarily, he's he'll just, you know, hopefully that Lady Walda, his wife will have a son and, you know, take care of the situation if, if Ramsay fucks up. And uh, I'm thinking Ramsey is going to be plotting something. We might see father versus son. That might be one of my predictions where Ramsey, he's, he's not subtle. Ramsey Bolton is not a subtle character. And I feel like he will kill Fat Walda in order to, you know, possibly ruin this chance that, that Roos will have another son. He wants to be the Ramsey Bolton. He doesn't want to be Ramsey Snow. He wants to be this like fucking alpha. And the fact that his father is considering disowning him a little bit. Well, if they don't find Snasna, then uh, there's going to be some problems. And wait, what's this? They won't find Snasna because, um, you know, they cross the river and the hounds magically disappear. And it's very cold. This river is freezing. But don't worry, um, Theon is well equipped to handle cold water more so than most guys, or should I say unequipped? There's not going to be a whole lot of shrivelage happening, happening here. So they get across the, the water and there's a moment where you start, oh, you start feeling bad for Sansa and you're like, oh man, Sansa, can you fucking like not suffer for once? That was a big criticism of last season. And I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Um, in the book, it was a different character. Jane Poole was the character who was, um, I, I believe she was pretending to be Arya, and she was suffering at the hands of the Boltons. Um, there was this whole plot about, um, you know, she was pretending to be so that way they had a, a fake heir. Like no one know, knew what Sansa as an adult would look like or Arya. So they were just like, oh, fuck it. Get this person. Let her, let her pretend. Um, but yeah, in the show, Sansa pretty much got shoehorned into the role of, of poor, innocent, um, abused girl again. And that pissed a lot of fans off. And I, I, it kind of pisses me off too, but, but I think this season we're going to start to see Sansa turn around and we're going to start to see some revenge as empty as, as a thing revenge is. I think we're going to start to see Sansa really come into her own. And I feel like, um, I don't think the writers can be a little weird. They're, they can be a little dumb sometimes, but I think that there is a very specific path and, and intent that they're trying to go down the specific road with Sansa. And I think she's going to be uh, a badass this season and the next season. Um, also, Theon, you know, there's this moment where he keeps her warm and it's like for the first time in a while, you actually give a shit about Theon again. Like he's... You know, first of all, Alfie Allen is is a, a genius. A genius. Th this man knows how to act. He has made Theon into probably my favorite, like, performance of the whole show. He, he really gets the material. He's amazing with it. And he he's just great. Alfie Allen is amazing. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going on this, like, journey with Theon where we're, we're okay with him. Then we like him a little bit. Then we're lukewarm to him. And then we really hate him. And then we hate him some more. And then we fucking feel kind of bad for him. Loses his, uh, his thing that he loves most in this world, which is his, you know, his be Bepis. And then I I'd like to apologize on behalf of George R. R. Martin for saying Bepis. Let me, let me correct that in Game of Thrones fashion and just say uh, he loses his cock. So that's, that's George R.R. R. Martin vernacular. And uh, yeah, Theon is, is absolutely 
fantastic, but he's kind of one of those characters that he's he's going all over the place, and now we kind of like him again because he saved Sansa, and he wants to uh, fight and protect her. And um, you know, then then some action happens, and then Brienne of Tarth, basically, you know, and Pod, you know, Pod the God, who's got, you know. <laughs> He's he's a killer with the ladies, and now we find out he's a killer with the sword too. Motherfucker, like decimates a number of soldiers, and Brienne is um, well at least more effective than Cap Captain Phasma, because she really takes out like a number of the the Bolton guards that find them. It's by the way, some people have complained that Brienne, how could she do that? How could she, you know, take on three soldiers? She catches one of them unaware. She's on horseback. Um, she's an amazing fighter. It's established that she's one of the best. Um, she, she really knows what she's doing and yes, she can take out a bunch of foot soldiers and she had pod and the unhelped a little bit too. So I believe totally, um, I, I'm not necessarily okay with the dogs disappearing, but I am more okay with her, um, being a badass. And then finally, like in one of the best moments for both. Brienne and Sansa. Sansa allows Brienne to protect her. She swears an oath. And that's all she wanted. So not only is Sansa now safe, finally. Brienne now has a purpose again. And she is happy that she's completed her task. Um, which is just kind of... It makes me hate Littlefinger a little bit more. Because Littlefinger kind of... Really he delivered her to the Boltons. And he knew... Well, maybe he didn't know how much of a scumbag Ramsay was, but Littlefinger, Sansa trusted him, and he's just, like, been full creep mode with her. And Brienne, last season, attempted to save Sansa, if you remember correctly, and Sansa didn't want it. She was like, no, I trust Littlefinger. He's, he's like my uncle, but he's like a kind of a creepy molestoid uncle. Not fun. And she paid the price for it, sadly. But um, finally, some relief for both of these characters, and I'm very excited about this plot line. Um, in the books, Brienne isn't even fucking here. In the books, Brienne, um, uh, Sansa isn't even here. Um, and Theon is, in the Winds of Winter excerpts, which I won't spoil, also not here. It's similar, but not quite. Um, so this is just a whole show thing that's happening that's so independent of the books. But I like it. I think this one works. Um, at first I was like, oh, really? But I'm okay with it. And it kind of makes me like Brienne even more. Oh boy. Um, well, here's where things start to kind of fall apart a little bit. So there's the, the ship sailing back from Dorne. Cersei Lannister, who is now, uh, <laughs> basically the whole fucking kingdom has seen her naked. She has atoned for her sins somewhat. She's shorter of hair and of possibly life st lifespan. And uh, she she has had poop thrown on her. And now she's back at the Red Keep. And there's one little bit of happiness. Lena Headey is just so amazing with her facial expressions. She she is so incredible with just the, the subtle nuance of her performances. And she sees the ship and, and she wants to see her daughter, Marcella. And it's just heartbreak. And th they were the director of this episode was was incredibly wise to just keep the camera on her because through her eyes, you know, there's excitement and then it just gets worse. She sees Jamie, Jamie's face. She sees this. And just heartbreak. And for a moment. Uh, I actually really feel bad for Cersei Lannister, who is one of the, the more fucked up characters in the entire show. But now I kind of really feel bad for her. And she, you know, if anything we know about her is she loves her family. She loves her kids. She knew there's a scene here with her and Jamie where she kind of explains that the witch, which we saw last season, um, 
in a flashback sequence uh, had explained to her that she would lose her kids. And it's kind of like just again, her acting's amazing. Um, Jamie uh, Nikolai does a great job here. And and the thing about it is, uh, this this hasn't happened in in the book. This again is a total show invention. Jamie is often in the Riverlands, learning that he could be a general, learning that he can be a tactician. He's still thinking about Cersei. You know, fucked Moon Boy for all I know. Um, he's not happy about Cersei in the book. In the book. He remembers something Tyrion said, which is that Cersei was was fucking a number of people. So Jamie in the book is still at this point where he's not really into Cersei that much anymore. And he's like kind of heartbroken, but he's learning to do other things. He's learning to be like this, the, a leader, not necessarily a fighter because he doesn't have his hand anymore. He's learning to be a leader. And in the show, it's like he goes to Dorne. And there's some like comically bad acting. And then uh, he retrieves Marcella. Marcella acknowledges that he's her, her father. And then and then she dies. Um, now, I want to talk about that for a second, because they were like right off the coast of Dorne when Marcella died. So why not have the ship turn around and go see Prince Doran? Maybe see if there's an antidote. Maybe raise some hell. Maybe say, what What the fuck are you doing, man? You know, why is my daughter dead from poison? But no, no, it just sails to, just keep sailing to King's Landing. This is where the show, uh, again, really falls apart. Is any Anything to do with Dorne is just so bad. It's, it's just not good. And, um... I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not a fan. Maybe he didn't know it was. It was. You know, them. I forget her name. Uh, Oberyn's wife. I, for, I forget her name. Elaria. Is it Elaria Sand? Maybe. Um, she poisons him. You see that. As all three sand snakes are on the shore with her. At the end of. Um, that plot line in, in the previous season, then. You find out that two of the sand snakes have sailed back to the boat to do some other dirty work. It's just so fucking weird. Um, anyway, poor, poor Cersei, poor Jamie. Fuck everyone. That's not a Lannister is pretty much what we got here. Right. Jamie's like, well, fuck them. Fuck everyone. We're going to get our, not Elia, Ilaria sand. Yeah. It was Ilaria sand. Um, you know, Jamie here is, is pissed and I'm okay with this. Like I kind of understand they're together to the end. They've been together. Um, it's still creepy, weird incest, but they, they do love each other more so in the show than in the book. And I get why this is going on. So I'm interested to see, um, what's going to happen here. I, I love Jamie Lannister. At first I hated him, but we love him now. And, uh, fuck everyone. That's not a Lannister. I kind of want to start seeing the mountain zombie mountain bust some heads open. Like I may not love the Lannisters. I don't really even like Cersei, despite me feeling bad for her a little bit, which is, I, I guess, kind of a, a testament to George's writing. And and again, David and Dan for adapting it, um, that I even have any feeling towards her whatsoever. Um, but she lost, you know, her father, she lost her son, lost her daughter. Um, and, and all she has left is Jamie. And it's just, it's, it's really sad. Um, just a brief moment with Septa Scary Pants, um, who, by the way, I, I looked up the actri actress. She's actually really fucking hot, and they just turned her into this scary Septa. Um, but yeah, Marjorie here wants to um, find out how her brother's doing, and she's still in the cells. They just want her to atone. I'm not sure where they're going with Marjorie. Um, I I like I like Marjorie in the book and the show, and I feel like there is a little bit of deception and deviousness with Marjorie Tyrell, but generally she's one of the better characters. She would make a good queen. And I like, I like her. And this is kind of just sad, just really, really upset that she's still here. And these fucking zealots are just holding her here. Jonathan Price playing the high sparrow. Amazing. So yeah, I'm kind of curious. I have like a theory that the direction that this is going to go in eventually is that the the religious zealots are going to get purged by um by Zombie Mountain and various other people. 
And I think there's going to be some kind of show showdown between Marjorie and Cersei. And I mean, this is all new territory. Books haven't gotten here yet. I have no idea what's going to happen. But I do like this plot line. I, I loved last season, the uh, the zealots. It was so it's creepy and weird. And I liked that, um, that, you know, they were such, it was kind of like almost a parallel to um, stuff that we deal with here in the real world. And uh, I thought the show handled it well. And I'm still really enjoying the, the religious takeover of King's Landing. It, it's a good angle for this plot line to go down. So let's let's hope it's explored further. And then this is pretty much AIDS. Uh, let me explain. So this is these this are the water gardens again, which um, I read a comment that Dorne never really feels like a real place because all you ever see is like this and a little bit of beach. And it's true. Like you, you really see a lot of the, the seven kingdoms, you, except Dorne. You see the, the riverlands, the mountains, you see the snow, you see the, um, you know, the, the, the taverns, the people, the, the, um, the, the cities, the towns, you see a lot of stuff. And then Dorne, it's just like, here's a bunch of, you know, people, dark skinned people, um, in a, in a beautiful like palace in the water gardens. And this is basically all you ever see except for a beach. And then you're just, you know, forced to buy all of this. Anyway, that's that's one aspect that I don't like. Then, you know, there's more of, you know, okay, so fucking Dr. Julian Bashir from Deep Space Nine, the probably the best actor in Dorne, probably my favorite character in Dorne. Prince Doran is amazing. He's he's peaceful. He's kind. Um, in the book, he he's stern. And he, you know, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's a master of, of patience. Sure. He's not impulsive like his brother, but he's, you know, he's, he gets the job done in his own way. Um, you know, seeing what happened next is just horribly disappointing. And again, I'm not going to actually play the footage because, you know, reasons, but, um, you know, so they're talking about stuff and she's like, well, you know, the people, how come you're, you're too soft, but we don't ever see his decision-making process. We only ever hear about it, which is show. Don't tell that whole rule does not apply to Dorn because I think David and Dan are now just trying to get this plot line into a different direction. And, you know, they, maybe the water garden's too expensive to film in whatever location that is. Um, I'm not sure, but they just decide to, you know, as soon as he finds out, that um, Marcel is dead from the messenger. Bad pussy. The girl who who, who says that um, Braun likes bad pussy. Uh, takes out Ario Hota. Here, I'll show you this little bit. No, well, I don't, I don't think I, I want to risk it. But yeah, yeah. There you go. Ario Hota, the man who's a POV character in the books. Before he gets more than five or six lines gets stabbed in the back. He's dead. Goodbye, character. You're great. Well, we'll never see you again. You never get to use that cool axe because you got stabbed in the back. And then, uh, yeah, Ilaria here um, stabs Prince Doran, um, his first scene of the season, Alexander Sadig, and uh, he's gone. Yeah, just kill him. So let's talk about this and how much sense this makes. Because she says that he would, he makes a bad ruler, you know, and that there, he's a bad ruler and he doesn't help his people. So in order to get revenge, also the guards do nothing. There's a shot of the guards. They're just like, whatever. They, yeah, 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 do it. Have fun. So they're either in on it or they're just like, whatever. Um, I hate this. I absolutely hate this. And here's one of the reasons I hate it. Her motivation for killing Marcella is to get revenge on the Lannisters. Because Elia Martel was killed by the mountain years ago, okay? Then Oberyn goes to King's Landing to get revenge. And instead of killing the mountain when he had a chance, he, you killed her! You raped her! You murdered her! And he fucking does all this, he dances, 
He's he's, you know, making a big show out of it. He's torturing the mountain a little bit. This again is his own choice. He went in there by choice for a trial by combat. And he he does all these decisions, you know, and she knows this. She was there. She saw it happen. And he gets killed because of his own bravado and his own lust for revenge. He gets he gets killed. The mountain um, who could have been dead crushes his face in. And that was his own fault in a way, too, because all he had to do was just, just stab him in the head or something. Right. She sees this. Doesn't matter. Let's kill a little girl. Remember when Oberyn says, ah, we do not kill little girls in Dorne. Remember when he said that? No, you know, you just got to go about 200 feet offshore. Then you can kill little girls in Dorne. Just, just not on the coastline. Get out into the ocean first and then you can do it. Oh, okay. So there's an exception. There's like a little star. There's an asterisk after we do not kill little girls in Dorne. Oh, man, it's terrible. It's, it's just awful. Her motivation is terrible. And then, then she kills his brother. And shortly after that, Tristane here, who is his son, who, you know, here's look at that face. Doesn't that face just, just scream quality? Just quality acting, just like comic, comic book cheese villains, you know, and then she's going to use a whip in a close quarter scenario. And then now what, what happens here? You know, we know what happens here. He's, he's ready. He turns his back to spear lady, right? She's going to use a big whip now in enclosed uh, space. And then, uh, see ya. Goodbye. Um, don't, don't ever, don't ever turn your back to someone with a weapon. So, Tristane's dead. So that's a good thing to do. Kill your, you know, your, um, your dead husband's, uh, brother and his son. Cause you want revenge on the Lannisters. And you want to seize control of Dorne. Good fucking motivation. And that actress who plays Ilaria Sand is great. She's been great in other things. But what are they doing with Dorne? It, like, it wasn't bad enough last fucking season. With this, this horrible acting, these characters, Sand Snakes, were great in the books. And they fucking suck in the show. They're just, like, you know, they, one-liners. You know, fucking facial expressions of just, like, just pure, like, comic book villainry. It's like, get them, you know what, have Lena Headey teach them how to act. Maybe then they'll know how to fucking make a scene and not chew it up and spit it out. It's disgusting. Um, yeah, these, so these characters suck. Their motivation sucks. Obviously, they were on the boat with Gendry and they were rowing towards Jamie's boat. And uh, that's how they, they caught up with him, you know, because they were on the shore in the previous episode. Um, the bad pussy. You want the bad pussy. Worst part of the show, worst part of the episode, Dorn needs to not happen anymore. Look at that face. D Dorn needs to not happen. I know it's going to happen, though. I, I, I feel it. This is no prior knowledge, but I feel there's going to be a war between the, Lannis the Lannisters and Dorn. And uh, there's going to be um, a big, a big war that's going to really bleed King's Landing of resources. That's that's my prediction. Uh, and it's crazy because now I'm rooting for the fucking Lannisters. Somehow this show has made me root for Cersei Lannister to have the mountain shove a fucking sword cock into the, the, the entire kingdom of Dorne. Um, I, I really don't like the direction Dorne has gone. Uh, I feel like in the books, it's, it's great. You get so much detail. You get a lot of, you know, like you really feel the history of this place. The characters are well-written. You know, the motivations are clear. Um, th there's a, a, a fucking... There is an emphasis on family in Dorne. And they, they care about each other. They care about their family. And you really feel what these characters are. And, and, and you, you know what they're going for. And it's not just revenge. I mean, there is that, but there's a little bit more to it. It's more complicated. Um, I'll just say that the book Dorn, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of characters that were, um, simplified. It was simplified in the show. There were more characters, um, 
Prince Dorian is still alive in the books. Um, then there's Quentin Martell, who I won't even go into because that's a whole big thing. Um, not in the show. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I mean, despite Ilaria disagreeing with Prince Doran, I mean, maybe later on she kills him. Maybe we don't. Maybe George R. R. Martin is going to put that in Winds of Winter. We don't know. But uh, in the book, he's still alive and Ilaria is not, in fact, killed him. I don't remember. Where where are we up to? Where are we up to in uh, in the um, in the books with with the, the Dorn plot? Let me know in the chat if you can, because then I can, um, you know, I'd be able to uh, talk about it a little bit because I forget. Uh, so, yeah, then there's um, Marine, Tyrion, and, and Varys. Nice call back to season two. We get uh, the, the two together. I love their chemistry. The, these two are great. Peter Dinklage is great. And Conleth Hill, amazing. Uh, the characters are fantastic. I like seeing them kind of mull over what's happening here. They're, you know, good people. They want to try to fix this mess that's in Marine. Um, and then Dinkles utters the line of the show. Which... We won't be sailing to Westeros anytime soon. We won't be sailing to Westeros anytime soon. And that's pretty much been the theme of Danny's subplot. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, the ships have been burned, presumably by the Sons of Harpy. So I'm excited to see where that plot goes. That would have been Barristan Selmy in the books. Um, yeah, so that that's pretty much where that is. And, um, next, hang on, what are we doing next? I'm, I'm looking at chat and I'm seeing, uh, Oberyn Martell dispatches the Sand Snakes, one to hunt Darkstar, one in the small council of the King, King's Landing, one to infiltrate the Sept of Baylor. Really? Also, Oberyn's dead. You mean Doran? Hmm. Well, that's, uh, I'm not sure what, I don't remember that. It's been a while since I read Dance with Dragons, so... Then you have um, the team of uh, Drawer the Explorer and uh, Unreasonably Handsome Man, uh, Dario from Chrono Cross. You basically are getting along really nicely, which is great. I like to see them as friends. They're, they're good buddies. They're working together. They may have their differences, but one thing brings them together, which is they, their love for uh, Daenerys. And uh, I really like this. And there's been some, you know, as we know, he's got grayscale and that's kind of a scumbag move. He should probably hack that arm off or at least tell someone. But yeah, it's, um, they see this big circle. If you could see that, that circle there, that shot, that shows you that there's been activity. So this isn't a plot hole. There's a lot of talk about plot holes in, in this, um, in this episode. And, and there's some that are the the dogs are annoying i get it but there's a few other ones that aren't as exactly plot holes so they see that they see the trail left by the horses the dothraki travel in large numbers so you know there's a disturbance in the grass and right in the middle there they find daenerys's ring so i i buy that completely originally last season i was like she's gonna drop a ring they're gonna find it come on but there's pretty much a giant bullseye so um yeah it makes sense and then Daenerys is back with um, Carl. In this case, Carl Nogo, because he tries to sleep with her. Um, everyone here is a frat boy, I'm learning. Everyone in this Dothraki tribe is pretty much just um, cracking jokes. I like the dialogue. It's, it's pretty witty. Um, also, Vinny, in Dance with Dragons, Obara San and Balon Swan are sent to get Darkstar. Tyene San and Nymeria San are sent to King's Landing. Quentin goes to Marine. Gotcha. Thank you, Nerolis. But yeah, they're pretty much, they're just cracking jokes. They're talking about what's better than seeing a naked girl for the first time. It's in the top five things. Um, it's it's kind of, I'm like, yeah, I guess so. But anyway, Carl Nogo, who tries again hard, and Daenerys is like, it is none. 
and she's like, I'm not going to sleep with you. I, I like that she's trying to be a queen and she's like kind of built up this whole reputation as mother of dragons and she's got a thousand titles and she's telling Carl over here like, hey, you know, I'm this. What are you doing? You can't, you can't fucking, you can't mess with me. And he's like, I don't give a shit. And I kind of like that because it humanizes her again. Because for a little while, Daenerys's plot was starting to feel like, you know, she was just this, like, this princess queen thing that just was inaccessible. And she was showing no weakness, even to her closest people. A little bit of weakness, but it was still, she she had come a long way, which is good because she needs that to rule. But she was just very far away from what she originally was. And um, this plot with, with the uh, the Dothraki kind of humanizes her again and makes you see that she's still a person. She's still a human. Um, she's not far off from a young girl in, in a lot of ways. But um, luckily, she tells them that she was... Uh, Khal Drogo's wife and they're like oh well I'll tell you what we got a place where you guys go you, you go sit in a place where you can um, hang out with other widows uh, until you die at Vice Dothrak which is the capital of the Dothraki human population um, who knows where the horses go but they uh, they go you know they want to bring her there and she's like oh shit so luckily she's going to be unscathed because as soon as she mentioned Khal Drogo, um, she was, they were pretty much like, oh, oh, I gotcha. Oh, see, no one will touch you, but you will go to Vice Dothrak and you will sit. There's only one place for the Khaleesi, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's um, going to be interesting to see how, how they save her, if they save her. Also, Drogon is missing again. Uh, no surprise. Those dragons are so fucking unreliable. Incredibly unreliable. Also, this dude does not make an imposing Carl. You know, Carl. He looks kind of more like a... Like, if you copied Carl Drogo, Jason Momoa, if you copied him in a Xerox machine, like, seven times, you did a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, you'd get this guy. He's like almost there, but he's just not even close to intimidating. Um, but then you have Arya's plot, which I thought, uh, I don't know where, what direction this is going in, but um, I really, I'm interested. And uh, She has a fight. She's blind now because she took the mask last season. She wasn't supposed to. She's now Ari the beggar girl. The, the whole thing in the book was that she has to become different people. She has to you know, do all these different things to become a faceless person. She has to be no one. In order to be no one, she has to be lots of different people. And now she's a beggar and she has to fight blinded, um, which there's really not a whole lot to say about that. But I, I will mention that um, one of the things I like about Arya's plot is the weirdness of it. I don't fully understand all the rules of, of how everything is kind of established with like, um, you know, What's his face? The kindly man, was it, that they changed to um, Jekhen Hagar? I don't really fully understand all this magic and what's possible and what's not possible. The The thing about, like, mysticism and magic in, in the world of Game of Thrones is it's kind of subdued. And when you, you see it, you get a sprinkle of it here and there. And it me it makes it kind of more powerful when it's like that which is what I like about Game of Thrones. There's a lot of, of human element and not just magic and dwarves and Frodo, let me brick in your mouth. None of that. You got more, um, Loras, let me brick in your mouth. He's like, yes. And that's, that's pretty much, ah, uh, why did he take it to that level? Come on. We were having such a good discussion. Um, I feel like we, we really get a lot of, um, that mysticism with Arya's chapter. And, one of the other things I enjoy about Arya's journey and, and her, her segments are that most of the big politics that we see in the show, there's a lot of, like a lot of big kind of huge decisions and these characters that are affecting kingdoms and, you know, a lot of politics, a lot of, um, you know, family stuff, a lot of things that affect a lot of people. And then Arya, it's just a personal journey. Is it for revenge? Maybe. 
I mean, by the end of her journey, it might not be anymore. At the moment, it is. You know, she has her list of names. Marin Trant, who's dead. Cersei. Um, all, all the other ones who I, I forget at the moment. But many of them are dead now. Um, I'm sure Tywin was on there at one point. And so now, really, you know, that revenge, the, the loss of her family that motivated her to want to do this stuff and the kind of just weird chain of events that led her here to Bravos anyway, which I think was set in motion by Sirio Forel. But that's that's a whole different theory. That's a whole different thing. She might not, by the end of this, want that same revenge, but I still think that it's it's an interesting personal journey for her. And um, Maisie Williams does a good job. And, uh, you know, I'm interested to see where it goes. Not my favorite plot line, but still pretty good. And we didn't really get much of it this episode. We got a little taste of it. And it seems like we're going to continue going in the direction of Arya losing her sense of self. And she's just going to get battered and beaten until she gets stronger. And, and then, you know, who knows what will happen from there. But, um, yeah, so that's my thoughts on the Arya chapters. Then you have... Um, Back at Castle Black, you have here the uh, Alistair and his men coming to the door. And the, Alistair is like, well, we'll set you free if you just uh, let us in there. Just let us in, Sir Davos. We'll give you a fresh horse and you can go south and you can do whatever you want. And, you know, they got crossbows pointed at the door. And what seems like a joke... I think is a very vital plot point, which is the whole thing with where Davos says that he wants mutton. He's like, ah, well, I can't go south without food. I don't like hunting my own food. Now, there was a theory, there's a comment I read about this, which I think is interesting, and I want to talk about it for a sec, which is that um, that was actually not Davos being a cheeky cunt. In fact, it was it was likely an attempt from Davos to see how how true Alistair would be about this request. Because food is in short supply at Castle Black, right? And uh, the winter is coming. So why would... If, if Alistair agrees easily to part with this mutton, then maybe he's just saying whatever Davos wants to hear, so he'll open the door. You know what I mean? So Davos like kind of does that and then Davos is like, we'll, we'll get slaughtered. And then someone else's theory was that mutton is like what, lamb or sheep? Sheep to the slaughter. Davos says, I've seen people like him before, we'll get slaughtered. And um, I think that's true. I think that he did test him and he was really eager to, you know, give Davos whatever he wanted. So that way Davos would just open the door. So like I said earlier, Sir Alistair is kind of a villain who has a good point, you know, perspective that you can understand, but he's still a scumbag. Make no mistake about it. He He's still, I think he would put a sword through Davos's heart in, in a second. So Davos will not open the door. And, um, you know, they're just trying to, they're figuring out what to do. And they're hoping that Dolores Ed, who has gone to get wildlings and bring them back to Castle Black, you know, Maybe those wildlings can help, like Tormund. So that's what they're waiting for. Again, I like the plot line. Uh, then we get to good old Melly, Melisandra, which um, I'm going to be very careful about what you see here because, well, YouTube. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, never mind. I'm going to have to go ahead and censor that. <laughs> fuck. Yeah, so she um, takes off her, her clothes and then, uh, okay, that's two parts I have to censor. She takes off her clothes and then she goes to bed and then we'll, we'll leave it there. Okay, so um, that's two, two nipples I have to censor because God forbid you have a nipple on YouTube. Um, the thing about this, this plot line is Melisandre is, I, I find her interesting because, oh, I know, I know, gross. I was like, oh, am I going to move it to that one spot where the old lady nipple? Yep, 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 yep. I think that was a costume, by the way. I'm pretty sure that was 
the actress in costume. Um, or, you know, prosthetics. Okay, so Melisandre is a character that I hated in the books and, and in, even in the show early on because she was so supremely confident of her visions. She seemed like a villain. Like she was manipulating these events on purpose for some reason. Like she wanted to manipulate Stannis the Manus so that he would do all this stuff. And maybe she didn't see things in the fire. Maybe she did. I don't know. It just seemed like she was kind of more evil. And this whole weird R'hllor, Lord of Light stuff. It's like, well, you can't really relate to that anyway. It's, it's just too foreign. It's too, you know, there's something not cool about burning people. So Melisandre is kind of one of those characters that I really didn't like and kind of misunderstood until fairly recently, which is when she started showing some level of humanity. She seems totally distraught that Jon Snow's dead. She's distraught that um, her visions lied to her. And she's distraught that Stannis wasn't the one that she thought he was. Um, she's You could see it in her face. Carice Van Houten, or Hutton, however you say that, did a really good job with the character, is still doing a good job with the character. So, you know, you can tell, like, she is distraught. She's not, a ha not happy. Either her god is lying to her, or she's misinterpreting the visions of, of victory. And she says when she sees John dead, but he was supposed to march on Winterfell and, you know, and fight the Boltons. So at this end sequence, she starts out, she gets naked in front of her mirror because I'm pretty sure it's in her contract that she has to get naked at least once or twice per season. You know, may, maybe that was like, <laughs> I'll sign on to do the show, but you got to show my rock and tits at least once per season. And then she basically, you know, takes the, the clothes off and takes her choker off. And then she looks in the mirror and she's an old lady, which I had known that she was older than her appearance. Um, but I didn't know how much older she's really old. And uh, that is her actual appearance. There's a few theories that I've been reading about and I find them interesting. And the first is. One, that it's not the choker that makes her look young. Because there's another scene where she doesn't have it on. Or two, there is it is the choker. And that scene where Solis, um sees her in the bathtub without it. If you look at her reactions, it's almost like she's seeing the old lady version of her. Maybe we just as an audience don't see that. That, I'll let you investigate. I'm not going to talk more about that. But there's also a theory that um, she is... And my interpretation is this, she is taking that off to see herself as she really is, to get a dose of reality, you know, because she's been seeing things wrong. She needs to look herself in the eye and just, you know, be reminded of who she is, which is a, what, 200-year-old lady? So there's that. There's a theory online that she might have, um, maybe she never goes to bed as an old lady. Maybe she... The, she never does that. This is one of those times that she does it in an attempt to maybe hopefully die in her sleep. So I read about that, that maybe it was a suicide attempt, that she takes off the choker and, and she she goes to bed as an old lady, you know, hoping that she would die in her sleep. That one I find interesting. I don't know what the intent exactly was. I think my interpretation of her just wanting to see what she looks like because she's at a very low point in her life. That could be it. I'm not sure. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really weird ending to the episode and it's kind of gross and also kind of sad. And there's some level of empathy that you then share with the character, which, uh, I hadn't done until last season when she rode back to Castle Black, I started feeling a little bit of empathy, just a little bit. Then this episode, I'm like, oh, I kind of feel bad for her. Like, maybe she really does just want to help. And she just got fucked by her god, or she is just weak. She's not seeing things right. So, yeah, so that's the end of the episode, pretty much. And um, I think overall, it was a pretty good episode. 
had some horrible moments that I think are just going to get worse unless David and Dan are like just fucking done with this, the, the Dorn plot and they're trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Um, and they're, you know, trying to find a way to make it as concise as possible. So that way they can just dump it like loose, like, like just loose change, just get rid of it. We don't need it. So who knows? Um, had some, you know, I didn't get as many answers for the many cliffhangers at the end of last season that I expected or wanted, but I'm okay with them coming, you know, a little bit more slow, a little more gradual, and I'm okay with them um, doling out the information over a number of episodes. I still think Melisandra is going to find a way to resurrect if she doesn't know how to do it already. I think um, my other prediction is that at some point, Sander Clegane is going to be resurrected and he's going to fight Mountain zombie Clegane and that's going to be fun. I hope that happens. Uh, I think Jon Snow is going to get resurrected and there's going to be a big battle with Winterfell. And then um, I don't know what will happen after that, but one thing at a time. And I also think that the White Walkers are going to, um, you know, eventually either at the end of this season or next season, break the wall down. You know, in the book, there's a number of potential ways to destroy the wall. And I think we're going to probably see some more of that this season. Um, we haven't seen very much of the Greyjoys. In the previews, we're going to see, you know, we saw that that there's going to be more Greyjoy stuff. Balon and Yara or Asha in the book. So I think we're going to see more of that. And I think maybe um, there's going to be some heavy shit this season. I'm not sure how much more Game of Thrones we'll have. I think it's going to be, my prediction is we'll get a season eight. So six, seven, eight. That would be you know, 30 episodes to wrap things up. So that would be good. Um, there was some talk that maybe they would do like six episodes of season seven and then like five of season eight, which makes no sense. Let's not do that. Just do three full seasons and then end the show and then book readers can complain and hopefully we'll get winds of winter. And then if we're really lucky and George doesn't die, you know, it sounds really morbid, but he's older and he knows it. Um, a dream of spring, which would be the final book. It's just, um, he's really getting older and the fucking winds of winter still not done yet. So, there is a possibility that we as book readers have to face, and I'm kind of okay with it, which is that the show may be our only closure to the story that we'll ever get. And it's a great story, which is why I'm talking about it today. And I really would like to see it written to the uh, to completion. But if that doesn't happen, then I think the show is still doing a competent job. It's not as good as it was in, say, season one or three or four which were my favorite seasons, but it's still, you know, doing a pretty okay job. I think we're going to see more divergent paths. We're going to see characters that um, we haven't seen in a while in the book. We're going to see characters die that we would normally see alive in the book. Um, we're going to see characters combined yet again. I think you're on Greyjoy. I think we're, we're probably not going to see too much of the Greyjoys. I think Yara or Asha might end up being the only representation aside from Balon we get. And if that's the case, then okay, that's cool. But I kind of want Victorian or Euron. But I mean, you know, for, for a TV show audience, it, it like there's a level of digestibility. How much will an audience be able to comprehend and digest and, and accept and understand? And how, how much they, will they be able to, will they be able to remember? You know, how many characters can you really expect a more casual kind of TV audience to actually keep track of? And I think we've almost reached that limit with Game of Thrones, but there's a number of characters that have been killed off. So I wouldn't be upset if they replaced a few of those characters with the Greyjoys, because in the book, they do have a, a lot of importance. So anyway, so yeah, that's my um, Game of Thrones Vine of Thrones um, recap, um, review, thoughts on season six. 
and uh, I hope you enjoyed them. Now, before we do anything else, would you guys like to um, ask a question or two? Um, I would like to know, interact if you have anything you want my thoughts on. Please, um, specifically Game of Thrones related, please uh, let me know. That's not what I wanted. There it is. Bran? Um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm definitely interested in, um, in seeing what happens with Bran's chapter. I feel like we're going to, you know, we're getting Bran again for the first time in a, in a while. And uh, I think I have an idea of what's going on. And uh, I think Bran's going to end up controlling one of the dragons. That's my, one of my theories. So, yeah, I'm, I'm already, I'm interested. I'm very interested in seeing what happens with Bran. Why is Podrick the greatest character? Because he, um, he he's a, a beast in battle and in bed. Uh, you think Sansa will end up becoming like Lady Stoneheart? I think so. Yeah, it seems like that's kind of what's happening. Lady Stoneheart has been cut, sadly. Or is Gendry still rowing? What I think is better, the books or the show? Books. I think the books are just... There's so much great detail. and, um, Like I said, the Dorne stuff is great in the books. And it's not as great in the show. So by default, I would say the books are better. The show is doing a good job, though. Why does the show have so many tits? Um, I think HBO just likes to um, kind of, yeah, they, they like to give people some eye candy. Uh, the book is definitely gratuitous as well. It's it's definitely like there's tits in real life, you know, and I, th I think in, in a setting like this, it's reasonable to expect tits and violence. And uh, sure, yeah, I mean, it, it's a little excessive in the show. Very much so, to the point where people have complained about it, but I think that, you know, just any HBO show, you're going to see that kind of thing. Um, someone says, I think Sansa and Brienne's story is actually better in the show than the books. Maybe. Um, yeah, I, I kind of feel like the pace has been sped up, and they're now on the cusp of actually doing stuff. And uh, the cliffhanger we had about Lady Stoneheart made Brienne's chapter really interesting in the books. So I wouldn't 100% disagree with you, but I'd also say that it, it's certainly two good plot lines, both show and books. Um, let's see. Well, I, like, yeah, the rape scenes, I mean... Again, like, you know, if you think back to our own history and medieval history in particular, we like we had a humanity has a really fucking brutal and dark past. And um, I feel like the show, whenever there is a scene that's that's hard to digest there, it's it's kind of not. Sometimes it can be a, it could feel excessive, but I would say that it, it just mirrors a lot of our own history. And again, a lot of it is in the books. So. House Forrester. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing them again. Sure. Yeah. From the, the game. They are probably mentioned briefly in the books to the point where that's how they were like, well, we need a, we need something that was in the books. So let's just go with this random small house called House Forrester. Let's flesh them out. If they're even, I don't remember them being in the books, but yeah. Um, what would, what things would I change in the Dorn sequences? Just do it more like the books. Just, you know, stick more with the source material. Dorn in the show is like mustache twirly levels of, of stupidity and evil. Or it seems like that. 
um, listen, if you're going to do Dorn, you got to commit to it. They were like, let's, you know, when you put your, your toes in cold water and, you know, in the pool and you're like, no, or you go in like to your balls or if you're a guy, if you go into your, like you go into a pool and it's cold and you go in just to like crotch area and then you're like, no, and then you get out and it just kind of sucked because you never got a chance to get used to it and you, you're you like in pain because for some reason, instead of going all the way in and getting used to it, you just let yourself just basically get a, a jolt to the system and it sucked. That's Dorn. They tried to give us a little taste of Dorn. And they oversimplified characters and they didn't give us enough of it. I would say that um, if there were 12 episodes per season, last season, they they really should have done like an entire, like full episodes worth of Dorn stuff, you know, and also the Sand Snakes. I'm sorry, but their acting and casting is just, uh, and writing. I don't know what the hell the Sand Snakes even are. I just, they're annoying. Um, fans don't like them. I don't like them. Stop. Um, how did Ms. Melisandre take a bath on screen without her necklace on? Well, that's the theory is that it isn't the necklace. It's just some kind of magic. She mentioned potions to Solis that she had potions that could make men desire her. So it could be potions that keep her young or... One of the theories is that if you watch that scene where she's in the bath without any clothes on, you know, her necklace, um, look at Celise's face. She's kind of horrified. She's acting as if she's seeing something really weird and really disgusting and not just a naked lady. Um, so there's a theory that what we see is not what she sees. So. Um, very... Or Veyrock says, I think Tyrion will do what Quentin Martell did in the books. I'm afraid that Tyrion's end is near. Nah, I don't think so. I think Tyrion's going to be one of the heads of the dragon. I think um, Tyrion will be around for a while. And I, I really don't think that he's... I think we'll get a taste of it. And I think another character that we're semi-close with will, will meet their demise to a dragon. Tyrion's too smart for that. I think Tyrion's going to get a brush with a dragon, but he'll be fine. And yes, the gif of the Sand Snakes fighting was, was really pointless. I agree. It, it wasn't very good. Uh, all right. Any last thoughts? Uh, anyone, anyone else? And then I'll go. Bop. That was not a bep. That was a bop. B-O-P. Bop. I just got an email from Teespring. Hey there, we noticed that you signed up for Teespring, but haven't launched a campaign. Mind taking a minute or two to answer the questions below? What do you mean I haven't launched a campaign? <laughs> what? Uh, thoughts on Tommen. Uh, okay, I'll end it with that. Tommen is, uh, I think there's going to be some interesting stuff with Tommen because he's now starting to, I think he loves Marjorie very much. I think the bad pussy was very good for him. And I think my theory is that um, Tommen's going to choose her over his mother. And he's going to blame his mother for Marjorie being locked up. And there's a, a like a trailer moment where I think there's like a almost like a standoff because of Tommen. And I think it, there's going to be some friction. And I also think that Tommen will die because that, that witch lady was probably correct about, um, you know, uh, about Cersei losing her children. So uh, it's it's sad because I like Tommen. He's not king material, but he's he's a good boy. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but I, yeah, I think he's, he's kind of pussy whipped at the moment and I think he's going to end up making some rash decisions to, to try to get his wife out of, uh, the cell. So we'll see. All right. Well, thank you.
for watching my Game of Thrones um, retrospective, my my uh, thoughts on season six, episode one. I will be streaming video games a little bit later on. And uh, I, I now have to censor some tits. So I will see you guys at some point in about an hour or two with video games. Until next week. I'm not sure if this will be a regular feature, but maybe uh, next week there will be more discussion of episode two. But uh, thanks, guys. I'll see you later. <laughs>